Hello everyone. My name is Pamela Cook Dreyer. I'm the wife of Bernard Dreyer. We have a bi-weekly video blog called It's Not Complicated and it, it normally is translated into French. Those of original outreach to French-speaking people. However, today um, we're going to deviate from our normal video blog format in order to do an actual Bible teaching. Um, my I'm going to be the one doing this broadcast today because I was asked to do it. Um, some people that know about some of my past um, wanted me to teach about it. Um, the topic today is going to be how to identify a good church or a ministry. And uh, we've also received a good number of requests from people, uh, uh, feedback from people who have walked through abusive churches and ministries that are walking free that we really feel like this will be a great help to them for me to share my experiences. Because of the amount of information that is being given in this broadcast, this broadcast will not be translated into French like we normally do. However, because of the content and the importance of the content, my husband Bernard um, has agreed that he will do a French version of what I share today. Um, the broadcast is to reach people that may be in situations like I was in twice, unfortunately, and because of believing lies um, from preachers in the pulpit and not understanding what I needed to do, you know, what I was allowed to do as a Christian in order to be free. During this broadcast, I will be listing a good number of scriptures um, that I feel are important for people who are in a situation that I have been in um, that you need to know. However, because of the number of scriptures, it may be a lot for you to try and take notes during this broadcast. So we plan to put slides at the end of the teaching when we edit the video, which will reference all the scriptures that I mentioned during this broadcast and some additional ones that I don't have time for. Um, I strongly suggest that when you watch the vi edited video that you go to the end if you're watching this broadcast live or if you're not, if you're watching this um, on YouTube later on, later on, I strongly encourage you to take a look at a list of those scriptures and write them down and really take a look at them because I feel like these will really help you to understand if you're in a good church or a good ministry or if you're not. The f first, there are several... Um, categories of things that I think are important to cover before I give you some guidelines to determine if you're in a bad church or if you're not. And um, the first thing I'd like to mention is about what the Bible says about who we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For those of you that um, would like to know, all the um, quotes that I give on scripture are from the King James Version of the Bible. When it says that we are that we are a new creature, some um, translations say that we are a new creation. That is saying that we are uh, that on the inside of us we have a new nature on the inside. Some sometimes you may hear it referred to as the inner man or the spirit man. That. That, that had, had, takes place when you are born again. You are no longer the person that you were before. You may feel like it, but you're not because a, a, the, a new nature has come into you. The old nature, the sin nature left when you became born again. I, I need to stress this. You have a new nature on the inside of you. You are not the same person that you were before. The one thing that... that um, a lot of people that are born again don't understand is how they can grow and begin to experience the things that they see in scripture about who they are in Christ, um, what new believers are able to do. There are a lot of many scriptures, we'll, we'll touch a few, many scriptures about promises that we can receive from God and um, miracles, the supernatural that we have access to. A lot of times, you know, Christians may not know what those things are or how to even begin to gain revelation on how to walk in those things. And so one of the things that um, has to take place is that our thinking needs to change. The Bible calls it renewing the mind. It's not that our mind is bad or anything like that, but what happens is we've learned how to do things solely in the natural. 
you know, uh, this natural world. We, we, we know real well how to operate in the natural world. What we don't know is how to operate in God's world, the real world for the believer. And so what we, what we do is we t renew our mind to what the Bible says we can do, what the Bible says we can have. Romans 12, 1 through 3 says, I'm going to read it here for you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me every man that is among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Not only are we brand new, we can be taught and we can have faith in what we're taught and believe it and we'll see those things happen in our lives. As we're transformed into what God has for us, we will walk out God's plan for our lives, as it says, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We'll walk it out as we are transformed into what the Bible says we already are in, in Him. The soul is the part, or the mind. The soul is the part that includes our mind, our will, our emotions, and our intellect. It needs to be renewed to what the Lord has already done for us just by being born again. As I mentioned earlier, the soul is not evil. This is how we live in this natural world. When you go to school, you don't go to school and learn from your spirit. You learn from your mind. You hear or you hear something and you read something and you decide and you learn. You know, we decide that we're going to follow God through our mind. Our spirit does not make us do anything. Our will, we decide what we're going to do. So the soul in itself is not evil. It just needs to it just needs to be renewed to the fact where we agree more with what God says than we do what the natural world says because th there are conflicts between those things at times. And one thing that will help us is one thing that we is one thing to read the scriptures is another thing to have revelation about them. And because some some scriptures may be obvious, but there's some things that may not be obvious, and they need to be um, revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. And so, the teaching, the Holy Spirit is a part, is what Jesus has provided for us in order to gain revelation of God's Word. That is the function of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. He was sent by Jesus when he ascended into heaven and sat, began to sit at the right hand of the Father. This is what John 4, 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever Jesus, I, have said unto you. The word for Comforter in that verse is paraclete, which means one called alongside to help. That's one that, will, that the Holy Spirit will help you gain revelation. He will help you understand scripture. He will never say anything outside of what, what God says. He, he's being sent in the name of Jesus. And he will teach you the things that Jesus wants taught to you. He will, help, he will be the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit in some translations will be your teacher. Here's another verse. These are some of my favorite ones because they really helped me down the line when I got into a couple of situations that I will explain later. John 16, 13 says, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That Spirit of truth in that chapter, and going back to John 14 through John 16, the Spirit of truth is talking about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, depending on your translation so that he will guide you into all truth and will show you things to come. This is the spirit of truth. This can happen through listening to a message of someone who is teaching the word properly and is being taught by the Holy Ghost, him or herself. But it can also happen directly as you learn how to recognize when the Holy Spirit is teaching. You can receive a, a revelation from God by reading the scripture and you get an enlightenment. Um, from the Holy Spirit as he is teaching you. I, I just love this. 
And here are a couple more verses about what the Holy Spirit will do for you. 1 John 2.20 says, But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Some other, other um, versions say that instead of unction, it will use the word anointing, which I just love this. This is one that we already have from the Holy One. That's because we're saved. We have that. We have that unction. We have the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I will tell you more about how the Holy Spirit works and how to activate the Holy Spirit in your life. Another verse in that same chapter, um, 1 John 2, 27 says, But the anointing which you received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as he had taught you, you shall abide in him. The anointing, the Holy Spirit of truth, the comforter, the Holy Ghost, however you want to call it, that anointing, says that anointing that teaches you is truth and is not a lie. The Holy Spirit will teach you truth and will never lie to you. Will never lie to you. Because of that teaching of the, from the Holy Spirit, you can know yourself if you're hearing the truth or not. You have that capability. Because further on down the line, you will see why I'm emphasizing this point. You, with your teacher, the Holy Spirit, you can know when you're hearing right teaching and when you're hearing wrong teaching. The way to activate your teacher, the Holy Spirit, is to pray in tongues. You ask, this is something you receive after salvation. You, you ask for the Holy Spirit and he will come into you and you will begin to pray in your prayer language. I'll go a little bit more into that in a minute here, but I want to give you some scriptures regarding the Holy Spirit and regarding speaking in tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, some people may get confused about that chapter because it talks about tongues here in this verse and tongues here in another verse and tongues here in another verse. And people may think it's all the same type of tongues, but it's not. You have the tongues that are that it says to be interpreted, you know, where if someone speaks in tongues in a service and someone gets an interpretation of it, that's for a public, that's for for, a pub, for public um, meetings and things like that. But the one that I'm going to talk to you about is about praying in tongues. What, you know, when you, you pray in English or your natural language, you know, you might pray about anything, but you can also pray in what is called an unknown tongue or um, your prayer language. There are different, um, different references to this in Scripture. The first one in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is the very first verse. I'll read that to you. It says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. The mysteries are not a, <laughs> a mystery to God. God knows all. The mysteries are mysteries that are related to our future related to our lives and we're praying those things out a lot of times we may not know what we're praying but sometimes we may get an understanding of what we're praying but it's not guaranteed more than likely you won't know you won't know at all until you walk your life out down the line but it's it, this is one clear where it says speaking in unknown time this is this is what they refer to as the prayer language where you pray wherever you pray you know privately or whatever you pray you are praying, just know that you're praying prayers for your life that you need. There may be things that you don't know you need, but you need. But the Holy Spirit knows those things. Another verse about this in 14 says, For if I pray in an unknown time, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Well, that's obvious because you don't understand. You know, uh, in, you know, some people, there's another type of tongue, I'll just throw this out here, there's another type of tongue that is referenced in Acts 2, where it talked about how when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they knew, you know, the people that were around them knew what they were saying. That was a, that was a totally different type of tongue there. Like I said, we won't go into all of them, but I just want to show you that there are different types of tongues, and sometimes people feel, you know, not everyone can speak in tongues. I'll prove to you that everyone can when we're talking about the prayer language. You can do that whenever you want to. And here's another verse, that, set of verses that talks about praying in an unknown time. 
um, not directly, but the context, that's what it's talking about. Romans 8, verses 26 to 28 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself, that's the Holy Spirit, making intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered or easily understood in some translations when it translates that. And he that searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit, what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to, these pur to his purpose. As I said, these, spirit, these, are talk these verses are talking about the prayer language here. It's talking about a prayer that we may not understand when we're praying it. Some say that it's groanings, or and some say words that are in, inarticulate. So basically, it's a language that is a real language, but may, you don't know it. It's not something that you learn in school. It's through the Spirit that, that as you pray, that communicates directly to God. When you pray in tongues, you can't pray in tongues too much. Some people tell you you can. You can pray in tongues whenever you want to. Just as often how you pray in your natural language, you know, you, you, you don't wait for a certain time to start praying. You decide to pray and you pray. You can do that with praying in tongues as well. So, like I said, these things are important. One of the things he's teaching you is about the Word, about the Word of God. And so another point that I want to really stress is the validity, about the validity of God's Word and the, point, the importance of you knowing it. Second Timothy talks a lot about this. There's a book worth, worth reading. He's encouraging Timothy, who is a pastor who is facing persecution, a lot of what is in there is encouraging to not to not lose faith and how to walk free from deception and to walk in victory. Because a, a lot of times when when people are standing for the truth, people you know some people who are deceived will come against you for that truth, you know because of that truth. And so um, persecution was happening during those days because the Christians were bucking against the Jewish, the Jewish system that had been there for years. You know, that, in fact, that was the only way at that time that people could come to God. But when Jesus came, he abolished that system completely. He abolished it. He said that the law that the Jews had to follow was, was, would now be written in your heart. And so he basically disrupted the Jewish system completely, you know, where you had to follow the law, you had to do all these different ordinances and things like that. And so those that became Christians suffered greatly for that. They were disowned, they, they persecuted, killed, I mean, just so many. They were just really going through it, and it would be very easy for the Christians, to, particularly ones that were Jews before, to turn back and go back to the synagogue. It would have been very easy for them to do that. So Timothy is one of the books that was written by Paul to encourage them not to do that, you know, to stand in the faith and believe God's word. And there are, some, there are a couple of references to this that I plan to include here. 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about the study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is clear. It says that we can divide the word. This, this verse is not just to Timothy. That's to us. It says to study the word, to show yourself approved, that you would not be ashamed, ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, meaning you will be able to read God's word and understand what you're reading so that when you hear a preacher, you can determine if it's good food or if it's a good teaching or not. You, you'll be able to do that yourself. These things that I'm, I'm, I'm saying this and I'm repeating this for a reason. These are things that you need to have a basic understanding on. I'm only just touching the surface of these things, but I'm just giving bullet points of things that you need to have a basic understanding on um, to, to, as a foundation for when we get into some of the other areas and then I start sharing some of my experiences um, in churches. Verses, six, um, I, verses 16 through 18 in 2 Timothy 2 gives an example of false doctrine and what false doctrine can produce, which is sin, and actually exposed 
to teachers of false doctrine in those, in those verses. So there's nothing wrong with false teachers being exposed publicly. He did it. Anyway, another, that's what we won't talk about that. But another um, set of scriptures is in 2 Timothy, verse, in chapter 3, verses 15, 16. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. It says all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Remember that verse. Remember it. All scripture. Remember it. As you can see, just from these two, there are many more. It is so important to know the scriptures. It is so important to know and, and reverence the scriptures. They are not God, but they teach us about God, and we can accurately learn about God through God's word as the Holy Spirit teaches us. Remember this. Remember this. Another thing that I wanted to emphasize here is one of the things that we are able to do as Christians. We have authority over the devil and demonic powers. We have authority. Yes, preachers have the authority, but I'm going to show you that if you're born again, you have authority over demons and demonic powers. You have authority yourself. James 4 Verses 6 and 7 says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil, and he will, uh, he will flee from you. The instruction is, you humble yourself, submit yourself to God. Then you can resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He didn't say he might. He said he will flee from you. You submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Another example. We're going to read Mark 16, verses 16 through 18. It says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You are saved, so you're not going to be damned. Okay. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, I'll explain that. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Two things that I want, two things that I've mentioned in this broadcast, it says that if you believe, you'll do these things. One is that you'll cast out devils, and the other one is that they will speak with new tongues. This, the tongues there is talking about the prayer language. It's not necessarily talking about the other ones, which are as the Spirit wills in 1 Corinthians 12. Again, we won't go through that today. Taking up serpents, there is a doctrine, a false doctrine. I need to mention it here before I go any further. Um, here in the U.S. and probably in some other parts of the world, um, they have this doctrine called snake handling. They take this verse here, and basically they, they say, if I take up a snake, you know, I can take up a snake and it will, it will bite me and nothing will happen to me. They used the example of Paul when he was going about doing God's will. I forget where he was. And he was bitten by a snake and the snake died. The snake died. And so what, what, they, what they do is they take that, then they take this verse, and they think, okay, if I really have faith, I can just pick up a snake anytime I want to, and it will, and it will die like, oh, no, there are a lot of dead snake handlers, okay? That I, I have to throw that out there, okay? So, so we can explain what the take it up serpents thing is. It's talking about if you're going about your way, and you, you take up, <laughs> you know, you won't be harmed. You won't be harmed if that happens to you. That's all that is, okay? I just want to emphasize again, these verses say that if you believe, the condition for being able to cast out devils is that you believe in the authority that you have to cast out devils. That is the only criteria other than submitting to God and make sure your life is clean. Because if, if your life isn't clean, it impacts your faith. It says if you believe, cast out devils, you can cast out devils. 
Another thing which doesn't specifically talk about cast out devils, but it talks about the works of Jesus. This is another one I love. John, we're going, going to read John 14, verses 12 through 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus said these things. He said these things to you. He didn't say, he said, he that believes, that's anybody. The context is anybody that believes. The works that I do, you will do. And greater works you will do. One greater work that, that may, be, may not be obvious is that the one thing that Jesus could not do was to lead people to himself because he had not paid the sacrifice for us. But he, he raised the dead. He healed the sick. He cast out devils. You know, I mean, just there were just so many types of miracles. He did creative miracles where the blind were seen, limbs grew out, uh, people got their hearing back. You know, so many things happened. You know, through the ministry of Jesus, and he said that we would do the works that he did. That included casting out devils, and he says that we do them if we believe. If we believe. But what happens is, a lot of times, we don't understand what Jesus actually said. Sometimes we may hear things that sound right, but they're not right. They're false. They're, they're lies. They're fables in the name of teaching the gospel and teaching the Bible, also known as false doctrine. And people may do this innocently, or they may be doing it with an agenda. But regardless, the Bible says, that we need to be able to know right and wrong doctrine, which I've shown you, you can through the word, word, the written word of God, and through revelation of the application of that word through the teaching of the Holy Spirit. There are things that the Bible specifically says about false teachers and false doctrine. Well, I'll give you a few verses here. Mark thirteen twenty two says, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Not only will false prophets give you false messages, they will produce signs and wonders that are not from God's spirit. They're from demonic spirits. And they, they can be so convincing. I've seen this. They can be so convincing that it will even get those that should know better. And I don't say that in condemnation, believe me. When you hear some of my some of what I share later, you'll know I'm not doing this out of condemnation. I'm doing it out of passion and and, and grateful to God that the Lord helped me out. Because <laughs> I didn't have a teaching to, to get out. I didn't have a teaching. I, I just leaned on what I understood about the Lord and what I understood about the Holy Spirit and He got me out. And I'm I'm forever grateful for that. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through, through 3, will tell you another way of how false teachers will come after the sheep and what their, their end will be if they don't repent. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumber not. Basically, if the, the, the heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, that may not necessarily mean that they deny Jesus the outright, saying that Jesus is not who he, he said he is. He, these people will deny the Lord by belittling what the Bible said the Lord would do or twisting it you know, to make it sound like something else, mm -hmm. disregarding what God did or whatever. That's denying the Lord as well. Jesus says certain things about who he was and what he said he would do. Those denying the Lord will say, Jesus did not say that, or this is not what he meant. 
anything to belittle or deny what Jesus actually said is a form, in my humble opinion, is a form of denying the Lord. And it said that, that many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That they're saying the truth is a lie. And the lie I'm telling you is truth. They won't say it like that, but that's the end result. They want you to, they will evilly speak about the word in some form or another. It won't necessarily be blatant at the beginning, but that's the end result. You, you will not follow what clearly the Bible says or what the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit teaches you what the word says. You will follow something else. And a lot of these teachers, they do this because they don't want you to know what the truth of God's word is. They want you to listen to them. They want you to be dependent upon them. This is the part that is so wicked. And through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. False teachers, whatever the teaching is, it doesn't matter what the false teaching is. The end result is they want to milk you of your money. They will say anything to keep you coming to them, keeping you dependent on them so that you won't leave so they can get your money. I'll hit a few ways on how they do that. And, and things that I saw. Next verse I want to reference is 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Some people use this verse where it says, try the spirits, where they're, they, they, they're literally testing whether, you know, maybe in the supernatural realm, whether you're dealing with an angel from God or if you're dealing with a demonic angel. That may not be fully wrong. You need to do that, you know, to learn how to discern if you have a supernatural experience or, you know, where the, where the source is coming from, if it's coming from God or if it's coming from the enemy. But this verse, if you take just that verse, you can read the whole book of John, 1 John, but if you just take that verse and just read that verse in its entire, entirety, I believe another way you can look at that verse is that you test the teachers, the teachers themselves, that, you know, because false teachers are out there. You need to be able to judge what the teachers are saying and discern what spirit they're speaking from. Because the vast majority of them, the particular ones that get really ridiculous and the things that they teach, they're, they're probably getting their revelation from a demon and not from the Spirit of God at all. So there are a lot of ways you can look at that. But the bottom line is you need to be able to understand from the teaching of the Holy Spirit and, the, and, and knowledge of God's Word whether what you're hearing or what you're experiencing coming from God or coming from Satan or just from a wayward soul, somebody that's just you know, saying anything, you know, they, they, it may not just be their unregenerate soul, you know, speaking, we don't know. But anyway, that's a verse that I wanted to keep you to keep in mind. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20 is a strong warning against false prophets, false teachers, false ministers, however you want to describe them. I'm going to read all five verses to you because I think it's important. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Very important. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? This, even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. That's a pretty damning set of verses. The false prophets are wolves. You cannot. They can try to produce good fruit. They can try to produce good messages. And in fact, in the beginning, they don't say anything off, generally. That's how they suck you in. They don't, they don't say anything you know, immediately. They will teach good messages and things like that, and you'll say, oh, okay, this verse, everything's fine. Okay, okay. And then little by little, this slips stuff in. But the fruit is all bad. It's all bad. First of all, they're false because their heart's not right with God. And number two, 
eventually their doctrine's not going to be right either. And, and, and sometimes it takes a while for that to happen. Sometimes it doesn't. But the fruit, you need to watch the fruit. And with the, all of these verses that I've mentioned to you, it is imperative that you be able to know how, how to discern what you're hearing. And through the scripture and the training of the Holy Ghost, you need to be able to understand who is a good teacher and who is a false one. We need to understand the word just like we know the backs of our hands. We need to know the word that well, and you can. You can. We must use it when we listen to a teacher. We must listen to it. I'm going to give you a couple more instances here, and then I'll get into the meat of, my, of what I want to share. But this is going to be a longer teaching, but I need to, I need to get these scriptures stated before I continue. I, and you'll see why in about in a couple of minutes here. Another verse is John 10:10. 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, who's Jesus, am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And a lot of messages I've heard over decades. I've been a Christian since 1977. I've heard this verse quoted, and they usually quote it and say that the thief is the devil, which in theory is, is correct because the devil, he, he doesn't like us. He would, he would, if he could, there would be no Christians alive, but he can't. He can't do that. But that's his intent. He will do what he can to neutralize, kill us if he could. You know, that's what the devil would do. But in the context of the chapter, in fact, I, I strongly suggest that you read later on um, John 10, verses 1 through 18. When you do, you will see that the thief in verse 10 is not Satan. The thief is a hireling or a false teacher taking advantage of the sheep. That's the thief. And it's, it's quite a compelling um, list of verses there. But it shows how a thief or a hireling who is not a true minister would treat the people versus how Jesus was, treats the people. We look at Jesus and we can see how ministers should be when they're relating to us. And this clearly shows, and this gives a, a blatant example of what a hireling or a false teacher would do. Last verse before I get started. I thank you for being patient here. Um, I want to mention uh, the, uh, the book of Revelation. I, I don't read in it much, but um, I was talking to a friend of mine a few days ago, and um, I feel like these verses will fit in another piece of um, what I share later on down the line. Uh, it's Revelation 2, verses 18 through 29. I won't quote it. But basically, this is what, if you are familiar with the book of Revelation, the first three, verse, three chapters are um, discussing particular actual churches that were ex existed in that day. And um, Revelation was given about the status of those churches, what they were doing good, what they were doing bad, and um, what needed to be corrected. And so this is uh, the church of Thyatira, which... Um, was a, a, a very good church. They did a lot of good things. They reached out to people. They loved the people. But their downfall, if they didn't take care of it, was that they tolerated Jezebel. Jezebel was a false prophet, and they did nothing to stop her. She was um, a literal person named Jezebel. They were, she was leading them away into fornication, a whole lot of stuff, and they didn't stop her. And as a result, um, Children, their children were killed. I mean, just a lot of things were happening because Jezebel was tolerated there. And um, the Jezebel spirit generally will manifest when you see a lot of false doctrine. But I need to throw that in there because all these scriptures that I'm mentioning here will come into play in this next section here. I mentioned this earlier that deception um, usually doesn't happen immediately. It'll come real slowly. They may start out teaching pretty good, and then little by little, they start slipping in a little something here, uh, and, uh, and then let, you know everything may sound really good, and then something else doesn't you know isn't lined up. But it's not a whole lot. But the 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 truth 
is diminishing and the error is increasing. It doesn't matter what the subject is. The, the truth decreases in the messages as time goes on and the error begins to you know, error begins to be brought forth in the messages. And I need to say that because that's how you get sucked in. I, I may have mentioned earlier, but this is how you get sucked in because you think, oh, okay, this is true, this is true, this is true, or whatever. But pretty much, at least in the two times I've seen it, actually three times, three times that I've seen this, it starts out really good and everything, and then little by little, the deception comes, and it gets to the point where you have to believe the deception. And we're, I'm gonna, we're going to get into some uh, examples of what I experienced off and on in 20, in 20 plus years, how it, how it came in, things I heard. And what I want to do with this section is mention some things that you may have experienced in a church or a ministry that you've worked with. And what I want you to do is compare what these things that I'm mentioning to the scriptures, the many scriptures that I've quoted to you so far. And you will see clearly that all everything that I mentioned completely goes against the things that were in the Word of God. Here's the first one. Do not be critical of a minister or teaching for any reason, because, because if you are, you're becoming a Pharisee. Have you heard that one? I have. I've also heard this one. This is another version of it. If you criticize what you're hearing or see that you're, if you are seeing, if you criticize what you're hearing or seeing, you're being attacked by the spirit of religion, which doesn't want you to experience all that God has for you. I heard that so much when lying signs and wonders started happening at one church. Don't reject anything. You know, the Bible says in John, you know, that Jesus did so many works that, you know, if they were all written, there wouldn't be enough volumes in the book to fill up the whole or something like that. I can't remember the verse, but it's, I think it's in the end of, of, of the book of John. They use that to tell you to accept things that I will explain later that are lying signs and wonders because you don't want to miss out on what God has for you, you know, that kind of thing. If you start using the scriptures like the Bible says in so many places to judge a, a word and you deem that there's something wrong with it when you compare it to scripture, they're saying that, well, you don't like authority. You're just being critical. You want to discredit the work of God. You know What they're doing is they're, throwing, they're hurling an accusation against you for the word's sake. They're coming against you for the worst sake. I can't remember where it is in the Bible, but the parable of the sower talks about that. That they will come against you, that you will suffer persecution for the sake of the word in one version of the parable of the sower. I can't remember which one it is. But that's what's happening to you. You may think, oh, I'm just a puny little Christian. I don't care where the accusation comes from. It's a false accusation because you're doing what the Bible says do is to study and you and you are to judge and beware of false teachers. How can you be aware of false teachers if you don't use the word? And if they come at you because you're using the word against them, bingo! Another one. This is my cue to really pull out my Bible. The Lord has given me a special revelation to tell you. There may be a, a revelation if it's from God, fine. Most of the time, if they're if if they're they feel like they're sharing a scripture for you, they're really humble about it. You know, to me, this reeks of self exaltation. The Lord has given me a special revelation to tell you. You know, it doesn't matter if it, if it uh, lines up with scripture or not. You know, if you say, you know, if you look at it and you say. This is a pile of junk. I mean, you know, if they start saying something and five verses come to your mind that contradicts what they're saying, they're talking trash. Okay, they're just plain talking trash. Sometimes they'll tell you, "Oh, don't, 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 don't nitpick about this or that or the other." You know, just catch what I'm trying to say. Just catch what I'm trying to say. Basically, disregard anything that's unscriptural. Won't happen. I'm on you now. I will take the scripture. Uh, call me legalistic, call me religious all you want to. I'm obeying the Bible and I am going to discern what you are saying. 
the Bible tells me to do it, and that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Another one. This is when my husband just really it gets to him. If you question what a teacher is saying, you are accused of using natural logic or reasoning. Basically, you're not to critically think. You're not to use your brain. Remember, God gave you the brain to use. It, I mentioned it earlier. It is your mind that decides what you will do or not. It's not your spirit, and it's not your body. If you have, if the Lord tells you something to do, your body's not going to t not going to decide anything. Your body's probably going to rebel. Your spirit man is not going to decide anything. The spirit man, they know what the, the, the spirit man is going to do, whatever God wants to do. The decision is made by you using your mind. You will decide what to do. Anyone that tells you that your mind is evil, run from them. If they tell you that your mind is evil, run from them. It's a different thing to say that your soul needs to be renewed to, the, to Scripture. That's one thing. But when they tell you to not criticize, not check out anything at all, run from them. I boldly tell you, run for your life because that's the thing that false doctrine tries to do they try and get you to quit thinking about anything they want you just to accept it oh yeah I'm saying the sky is red I'm telling you the sky is red I don't care if you look out there and says look it's red don't don't reason it's red I'm telling you it's red and receive what I have to say that's what cult leaders do all the time. They try, they dumb down, they get the people to dumb down and shut down their common sense. Shut it down completely. Where they don't think about anything. Well, so and so said this. A lot of times in church, my pastor said this. My bishop said this. The apostle said this. If it lines up with scripture, beautiful. If it doesn't, run. Run for the hills. Okay. This is my favorite one. My favorite one in this list. I have a few more, but this is my favorite one. The teacher or minister, they give you an outrageously long list of things to do that you have to do before you receive from God. It can relate to anything. Those that may have seen my, my introductory broadcast a while back on Waiting on God, I talked about um, the fact that I didn't get married until I got past 50. I, I lived single, had a wonderful time in the Lord and everything. I, I was single a long time. That's this is one this is one of my pet peeves. You got you gotta do a thousand things. You're not married because you're not ready. You're you, you know, if 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 you you know, if you're not married, you, you there's something wrong with you, you gotta get everything straight, you know, everything. I mean, the list is just endless, you know. I didn't get married till I was fifteen until I didn't meet my I didn't meet my husband till <laughs> You know, I met my husband, <laughs> you know, so it wasn't anything deep about it, but it was this long list. Another one, finances. You got to give. So to it hurts. You know, if, if it don't, if it, if it don't, you know, move you, it won't move God. Anything, you know, you got this long list. You got to give to the man of God. You got to, all this stuff. You got to speak over your seed. You know, don't say anything negative or else you got to, just a mess. Another one is that I'm going to touch on a little bit more because this is one that I have personal experience with. You got to go through all. You got to go through all this stuff to be free from de from devils, quote unquote, free from devils. If you're feeling oppressed, feeling, um, then you're you know you may be literally oppressed, but sometimes it's just a feeling. They'll tell you to get rid of an endless list. I mean it's. Endless. I will mention one that um, someone that contacted us on IctusNet Live. They told us about a ministry in, a, um, in here in the U.S. And so my husband and I looked it up, and I've said because of the experiences that I've been through, I told Bernard, I said, I don't even have to look this thing up. I'm gonna tell you right now. Somewhere on that website, they're gonna tell you that owls are evil. Somewhere on that website, they're gonna tell you that owls are evil. And he looked at me. Sure enough. Owls and frogs, I could tell them. That, now, there were some things on there that 
I just I, I just laughed out loud. One was that um, you couldn't have a wedding veil on your face because if back back in the day, if you had a veil, it, was, it had something to do with violence or something. I don't remember all the nonsense. Another one was that if you had flowers at your wedding ceremony, you shouldn't have that because um, in some cultures, um, flowers was supposed to ward off the spirit spirit of barrenness. Well, that chance I had flowers at my wedding. I had I had a veil. I suffered no violence, and they, let me tell you, it had nothing to do with increasing my fertility <laughs> at all. You know, <laughs> so, but seriously, basically, if you have anything in your house, if you don't know who made it, get rid of it because somebody who was in witchcraft may have made it. Insane, I know, but this 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 stuff is out there. I went to a church; they would not quote cast the devil off of you unless you took a twelve week class on deliverance. Okay. Never mind that the Bible said if you believe you can cast them out yourself. <laughs> See what I mean? I hope you're, you're hearing what I'm saying here. Most of this stuff has nothing to do with any of the scriptures that I mentioned and more that, that, we'll, ref, that um, we'll put at the end of this broadcast. Next, this is where we get into, where we get into the validity of God's word. A, a false teacher in some form or fashion will either tell you the Bible is full of mistakes, full of errors, contradictions, myths or fables, and another one I'll add, they will tell you that certain sections of the Bible that were written to you, they'll say they're not for you. Another way, basically they're demeaning the value of God's Word and and the accuracy of God's word. In one form or another, they'll say it's full of errors, full of contradictions and myths. A lot of the contradictions have been proven to be not contradictions at all. But they throw that out there so you won't take it seriously. That you won't basically they want to devalue the word so you won't use it to judge what they're judge what they're saying. After they devalue what the scripture says, then they'll say that God again, God has given me a special revelation to reveal truth to you. Forget the Holy Spirit being the spirit of truth. Forget that. I have a special revelation to reveal truth to you. Anyway, next, if you hear a teacher, I had this happen, hear a teacher saying that an angel appeared to them and taught them something, taught them doctrine. Not once in the scripture, anywhere, Old or New Testament, will you see Anything that says an angel teaches doctrine is not in there. The word teaches doctrine. Teachers of the of you know real ministers of the gospel teach doctrine, not angels. Uh, they, they they may fight on your behalf. They, they minister to you, yes. They'll fight, they may fight on your behalf, intervene, you know, to protect you and things like that. You see that in, a lot in there. They may. Um, they may tell you something like in um, Acts, I think it's in the 10th chapter where Cornelius was led by an angel to go to send people to go where Paul, where Peter was and that kind of thing. That angel didn't teach anything. In fact, the angel told him that there's, you go, to, go over here and there's somebody there that will tell you what to do. I think that's probably the closest thing to, to show that an angel will not teach you doctrine. They may you know, tell you where to go or something. I mean, that's what happened in the book of Acts there. He said that there will be somebody there that will teach you what to do next. Cornelius was praying. The gospel came. First time the gospel was preached to um, non-Jews in the Bible. So if anyone says an angel appeared to them and, and taught them something, run again for your life as a devil. If you're in a church, I haven't seen this in, in any of the churches that I've been in, but a lot of people that I've known over the decades have been in churches like this where they incessantly teach about authority, where you cannot breathe, you cannot wipe your behind, you can't get married, you can't do anything without going through them. You can't do You got to go to them to get permission to get married. You got to go to them to protect for you take a job. You got to go to them to do anything. And they tell you if you do not submit to what they say, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to submit to 
godly authority. Yes, there is godly authority, and, and you should take counsel from those that are really godly. They're not going to have the clamp on you, though. They won't have the clamp on you. Anyway, I've heard from so many people that have been in, in, in churches like this where, they, where you could not move. You had to go through the rank. You know, sometimes those different levels before you before you could they they would decide if you could do something or not. Another thing that you may have noticed, if not, I'll mention it here. Um, a lot of these churches that get into false doctrine, a lot of them, they spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament, we didn't have direct access to God at that time because Jesus had not paid the price. For our sacrifice. So they went through prophets, they went through, you know, generally the prophets back then, from what I remember. You know, you, you went to the prophet, you gave him a gift or something like that, and they, they, they would pray and hear from God for you and that kind of thing. And that was legitimate back in that day. We don't have to do that today, folks. We don't have to do that today. We can go to God for ourselves. Now, there may be times that the Lord, may, the Holy Spirit may lead you to do something, that's fine. But we, we, I rejoice in this. And, and I learned it along the way. We can go to God for ourselves. We can go to God for ourselves. And the Holy Spirit is so lovely. He never condemns when he corrects. He never condemns when, we, when he corrects us. He's very gentle. He's a teacher. A good teacher will not condemn you. What parent, good parent, let's put it that way, what good parent is going to, you know, if you're two years old, or, or one year old, and you stumble and you fall and you're trying to walk, they're going to cheer you on and say, no, no, try it again. They're going to cheer you on. They're not going to say, oh, you fell down. What? You know, they're not going to do that. You know, not a good parent. Holy Spirit is so good. Oh, my goodness. I so treasure the Holy Spirit because if you're sincerely asking for truth, the Bible says those that seek him will find him. He'll find you. If, you're, if your heart is open to truth, he will teach you. If you, need, if you need adjusting or correcting, the Holy Spirit will graciously give it to you. Embrace it. Don't feel any shame about it. I mean, if we didn't need a teacher, why did he come? Okay. You know, we, we don't, we're not born naturally and we're full grown. We grow up, we, you know, we grow up along the way. And parents and teachers in school, you know, they train us. Same thing in our walk with Jesus. Uh, Jesus cleans us up, you know, gives us a new nature on the inside, take the old nature out, and the Holy Spirit is our instructor, our tutor, our teacher. It teaches us how to walk and, and to learn how to commune with our Father. Most of the time when you're dealing in churches, they don't teach you this. Uh, in, in some places, they don't, ever, they don't ever mention that you're free from devils. They don't ever mention that, that you can directly go to God for yourself. They don't mention that you can cast out devils. They don't mention any of this stuff. They go into Old Testament. They pull out, oh, my favorite one was Elijah and Elisha. They pull that one up all the time. So basically, Elisha helped Elijah, and he got a double portion of, of his anointing, you know, or whatever. You know, and so that, that's another one they pull out. They really pull on those that want to preach. They, they use that one. But uh, like I said, all Old Testament, they don't talk anything about the covenant that we're living in, or a better way to say, it, the family that we're in, the family of God. You know, because we we relate to we relate to our father like children in a healthy relationship with their parents relate to their parents. That's the, that's what we're walking in today. If you've ever had this happen, and probably those of you that have been in situations like I was in has had this happen. The teacher will, if you if you sincerely have a question and you go to the teacher and you tell them, you know, I, I heard what you're saying and I'm trying to I'm trying to understand this through the word, and you mentioned maybe a couple of points that they said that that you didn't understand because the scripture says this. If they like come after you, I mean like, how dare you? I mean, how dare you question me? How dare this? You're in rebel. They'll cause you to be in rebellion and all kinds of things. You nailed them. That's what happened. You nailed them. They got mad because they realized that you're that you understand that they're wrong. They got mad. They didn't like it. They thought they had you, but they realized that they didn't. That's a red flag right there. 
If that doesn't happen, say it's a situation where you may, you may not have talked to them personally, but maybe you might have sent a letter or an email to them or something with some questions, you know, similar questions or whatever, you know, and you, you did it nicely. You didn't do it in an accusatory tone. You just, you just said, well, you know, you said this and this is what the scripture says, you know, it doesn't matter how nice you are. They'll either explode or I've had this happen. If they don't respond to you directly, what they'll do is they'll preach on you the next service. They'll, they'll, they'll include enough in the message, you know, where they, where there are bits and pieces and phrases of a conversation that you had with them, or an exchange via email or whatever, and you know that they came back. That was their answer to you. Had that happened too, you know. Basically, those teachers, they if, if they don't respond to you but do something like that, they're too cowardly to come to you directly. And I hate to say it, even though they say that they love God and they love his word, they hate his word and they don't want to hear it. While trying to tell you that they have a revelation of God for you that you better accept or else. Basically, they're saying you better be, quote, teachable and listen to everything that I say. But if you, if you present the word to them, they raise hell. They go after you either directly or they preach on you in messages. The Bible has a lot to say about judging somebody about something that you're guilty of. This is one that they do all the time. They do all the time. They tell you better be teachable. In their mind, being teachable is you better accept everything that I say or else. That's their definition of being teachable. What a mess. What a mess. They also will preach something like that to neutralize you. So if you decide you want to talk to somebody else in your fellowship or congregation, they'll remember what, quote, the man of God said and dismiss what you have to say. There's a lot here. I think I'll keep going here. But um, these are things that I heard over many years. And... Uh, I feel are incredibly important for you to be able to recognize things that totally go against scripture and that you do not have to sit under. In fact, you probably should run. This is another one that um, they, they say, I'm right. They'll say it several times, particularly if they've been challenged and they're getting back at that person, you know, in the message. They'll say, I was right or I'm right. And then they may proceed to tell you about how inaccurate the scriptures are and all that kind of stuff. Like I said, all this stuff ties together. But um, if, if, if they say I'm right a whole lot, that means it's all about them. They're not teachable. They're not teachable. If they say they're right, that means you're not. And don't come to me with anything, even if you say it's from scripture, because I'm right. How many times does Satan say I in Isaiah? How many times? Seven, I think it was. Anyone that does this, anyone that does this is just a big playground for Satan. He loves people that have problems with self-exaltation and or the love of money. They'll get you every time because they will play on that ego, particularly um, if you're a teacher and you say you have a revelation, you know, if you have a have appear, you know, angels or Jesus, supposedly Jesus appearing at you and all this stuff. Woo! Yeah, I have the inward road of God, and who are you to tell me anything? And some of them may say that, you know, if, or if they say that somebody came to them and, and, and said something, it's like, I don't need that. I don't need that. Watch out, people. And if you try and leave, you're cursed. They'll tell you. If you leave, the big bad devil's going to get you. He'll devour you. If you leave us, the big bad devil's going to get you because you're going to be you're going to be out of the reach of God's hand. God's everywhere. How can you be out of the reach of God's hand? God's everywhere. How can you do that? Impossible. If you're saved, you're in His heart. You're in the palm of His hand. How can you get out of God's reach? Tell me. There's no verse for it. Anyway, the last couple of things that I'm going to tell you happen at a church. 
if you see any manifestations like gold dust, glory jewels, feathers, or anything like that, they're either, they're either coming from one or two sources. They're either lying signs and wonders manifested by demons, or it's trickery. They want you to get into sensationalism. They want, to get, they want you to get into just, who experienced God? Just outrageous stuff. I've been in the scenario where it, there were lying signs and wonders. It was not trickery. I have seen people I know where the gold dust, they had dark colored hair, and it just started showing up. It didn't fall from anywhere. It just started showing up in their hair. I've seen that more than once. I haven't seen the glory jewels, but I've heard stories about them. Same thing, you know. And uh, But I, I have seen that myself. Um, if you experience any other kind of supernatural experience that the Bible clearly speaks against, I will tell you plain, the devils is not from God. I will tell you plain, not from God. If you find yourself in a situation where you got healed or, quote, set free from devils, and then all of a sudden you have a stronger oppression, you go again for prayer and blah, blah, and you get a stronger oppression, get healed or whatever, and it, it keeps going like that, devils are in the midst. Devils. It, you can, the Bible says that if you believe, Time and time again, you receive from God whatever you receive from God is because you believe. That's the word, I think it's in John 5, where it said that Jesus was asked, how can I do the works of God? The, Jesus said, the work that you do is that you believe in whom the Father has sent. That's the work. Believe Jesus. That's it. That's it. Another one, if you have, if you str if if it's getting worse, you know the oppression and all of that, and they tell you, you got to go thousands of miles to, to get healed, to be set free from demon powers. No, you don't. I've I've already given you all those verses for that. This is one that gets me. This is why I included the scripture verses in Revelation about the Church of Thyatira. If all of a sudden, you know, you might be seeing different things going on or you might start hearing a little bit of false doctrine and stuff like that. But if you begin to notice that a significant number of people in your fellowship or their relatives are dying or experiencing horrible calamities within a, you know, outside of the norm of what will happen in life. You know, say, for example, if, you, if you're going to a congregation, going to a church or something like that, and half the people... Are, uh, half the people are under are under oppression. Half the people are having um, a lot of attacks and things like that. Or so many people are dying of cancer. I mean, just a, an outrageous number. That kind of thing. Um, there's a good chance that the spirit of Jezebel is in your midst. Very good chance of that. For example, the um, preacher, the promoter of the gold dust stuff back in the late 90s and her chief minister were dead of cancer within 18 months or two years. I saw this, I won't go into too much detail about it, but what I just described I saw happen at a church and uh, it was horrible. Half the church was demonized. If any of you are familiar with the spirit realm, particularly those of you who used to be in witchcraft or Satanism or things like that, you can look in the eyes and you can tell. Sometimes they, sometimes it was demonic. Some, sometimes um, I know chemical imbalances can do that. But half your congregation, devils. They thought they were having encounters with God, and it was devils. You know, and had been told, "Don't reject anything the Lord has for you." Devils. You know, and when you, the bottom line is, they tell you that we know, we know what you need. Listen to what we've got to say. We have the special call to reach out to you, you know, we, that we have the call to minister to you. Please hear what I'm saying or you won't, you, you'll miss God, you know. Some of these people are the most unteachable people you will ever meet in your life. They don't want, you know, they want you to, quote, be teachable and hear what they have to say, but if you present the scripture, you could be as nice as could be. They don't want to hear any of it. They don't want to hear any of it. You, 
they have the revelation for you. But you, you know, you're nothing. You can't hear from God. Huh. Bob, I prove you. Oh, yeah, you can. Not only can you hear from God, you can discern them. <laughs> you can discern them. Thank God for that. But anyway, this, this is just a brief amount of things that I've seen over the years. I'm, I'm doing the most, um, what I feel the most dangerous ones on. I could give any of you, if you're familiar with the, the money-grubbing prosperity preachers, that's a whole nother set of, of things, you know. But they generally don't get into areas of uh, sensational signs and wonders, and they generally don't deny Jesus in that, in, in that kind of sense. They basically just focus on, on the money, and, and you, know, you won't be blessed by God if you don't. But like I said, to me, that is not as dangerous of a doctrine as some of the things that I mentioned to you because so many people have been destroyed by these types of uh, these types of doctrines, some people have walked away from God. I would say they walked away from who they thought God was. They didn't, and it, again, this is not a judgment. We're all are learning about the Lord and, and, and who He is. But they w they went into a church where they didn't really understand the loving heart of a Father. You know, the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't died. You know, he hadn't died to give us free access and that kind of thing. So they heard a lot of things that were not accurate for where we are today, you know, in our, in our walk with God. And if you've heard any of these things, particularly if you hear, the, hear this on a regular basis, your only option is to escape. That's it. The only option for you is to leave there because it will get worse unless somehow God opens their eyes. It will, it will get worse and the longer you stay there after you know that you're in a mess, doctrinally speaking, you will be neutralized more and more. If you, if a lot of times people have taken signs, I've heard this off and on all my life, where um, when I was in biology, we would do experiments with frogs, and sometimes they would I would hear, and like I said, I hear this hear this a lot. If you put a frog in cold water in a pot, in a, a big saucepan or something like that, put it on top of a burner on a stove, and little by little, you just turn the heat up. The water just gets a little bit warmer. A little bit warmer, and they get amalgamated to the cup, you know, uh, get used to it. It'll get warmer and warmer and warmer until the frog is cooked. If the frog had jumped into boiling water, gone. They'd be gone in the flash. They would have hopped right out. This is what happens when, as a Christian, you sit and you hear. Little by little, little by little, little by little, it increases, it increases, the deception increases, truth decreases, and it keeps going. And, and unless you have an understanding of the word, at some point, they got gotcha. you. They got gotcha. you. And if you do recognize it and you stay, the shock of it will die down. Will die down. It just happens. Trust me, it happens. <laughs> I know. Okay. And so um, I am suggesting to you strongly get out because you you will not go further in your walk with God because you are you you are operating under a false set of uh, a false picture of who God is and who you are as a Christian. You will never see the Bible fulfilled if you don't get out. You have that, that, There's no option. You have to get out of there. And uh, the, 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 the one thing that um, I did uh, when I found myself, I, I was in two churches back to back, different types of deception, and what got me was it started out really well, and then the enemy found something in each leader that he could take advantage of and turn both of them. After the second one, I just I said I wasn't going anywhere. 
I was at a point at that time where I, I began to learn a lot about the Holy Spirit as my teacher. I wouldn't have said it like that back then, but that's what was happening. I, I, I had gotten to a point where I was able to discern teaching and doctrine. I was able, I was able to discern if uh, Spirit was from the Holy Spirit or not. I could sometimes, depending on if I was in a season of prayer and that kind of thing, I could tell you. Uh, what kind of demon it was, or how many were present, that kind of thing. So I at least got into that point. And so the deception that I got into, and I, I'll mention this, because a lot of times people will stay after they know that the leader is in some kind of deception to pray for them. And uh, that is a sincere desire, because more than likely you care for the people. You know, you've, you've made relationships there. And you care for the people and you want to reach out and you want to help them and you know you, you want to pray because you know you taught prayer works, you know, prayer changes things, you know, all those kinds of things. And so you may really feel like you should stay and pray there. And I did this at both of the churches, but what happened was when things got to a point, particularly in the supernatural realm, that I just could not fight off stuff like I had before. I ran, particularly from the, the one where they had the lying signs and wonders and things like that. And when I left, I was so spiritually beat up, beaten, that I couldn't, and I knew something had to be wrong. God would not have put me in a situation that I could not handle, the Bible says. He will not put more on you than you could bear. I was in a situation that I could not bear. So I knew the Lord did not do that. I knew that I had missed him somewhere. And so I had asked the Lord. I, I stayed away from church for a, uh, about a year, year and a half before I started attending the church down at now regularly. And I was just scared to go anywhere because I was afraid that you know I was going to be beaten up, deceived, attacked. I just I felt like Church was the worst place for me. I felt like I was safer at home praying. And at that point, it probably was a good thing. Anyway, my deception wasn't so much the doctrine because I recognized that the doctrine was wrong. My deception was I stayed too long because I felt like, you know, I, I wanted to pray for them because I'd seen intercessory prayer work. You know, I've seen prayer in my life. You know, and I wanted to stay because I cared for the people, particularly the second church. But what I realized was I had no biblical support for that, none at all. The Bible says to flee false doctrine. I've, I gave you plenty. It says beware of false doctrine. I gave you plenty of scriptures. There'll be more at the end of this uh, end of this video. And uh, I was at the church that I attend now and heard a minister, and all he was doing was reading verses about run for false teachers, <laughs> beware of false doctrine, those kinds of things. And I was just like, the light bulb came on. I had known those scriptures. I could have quoted them to you. But during that delusion, I, they didn't cross my mind. That, that can happen to any of us, you know. And so I thank the Lord. I felt no shame. I hadn't. And I said, Holy Ghost, you did your job. You taught me. You told me what I needed to know. I will never do that again. <laughs> you know. And so you may be in a place where um, you leave. And you uh, have, um, you know, battle scars. I guess that's the only that's the only way that I can, uh, you know, describe them. You know, you feel like an idiot for getting into something like that in the first place. You feel like an idiot, and you, um, you know, thinking, how could I've gotten here? I'm not belittling what happened to you. Believe me, I'm not. But we need a teacher. I don't know how to say it. We need a teacher because we don't know. <laughs> you know. We don't know. And so we need a teacher. All of us need a teacher. As I said earlier, if we didn't need a teacher, the Holy Spirit would not have been sent. Period. We're all in a, we're all in a place of learning. We all have believed something wrong somewhere. But we can trust that precious teacher of ours. We can trust the teacher. He won't condemn us. He'll lovingly correct us. He'll show a scripture sometimes, you know, if we've studied, and he'll bring a scripture to mind. That's what happened to me. And I rejoice when, when, when that preacher, he just read those words. I rejoice because I got my answer. That's all. I don't care. I have no pride in that area. I don't care. Tell me what I need to know. 
<laughs> you know, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't like pain or agony. I don't like any of that. If I can avoid it, I will. And I know, you know, the only persecution I want to go through is for the cause of Christ. That I can't prevent. All the rest of it is either because I'm, 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 you know, rearing up or I'm, I'm believing something wrong. Those, those can change. Those can change, change me. <laughs> you know, that's kind of where I'm at with this. But, uh, you, you know, about the battle scars, it may take some time for you to really release all of that. Some of you may, you, if you may be angry. A lot of people are angry. You may be angry at yourself. You may be bitter at the teachers. You know, anger, that, that may even be a normal thing because you've come out of a war. You come out of a war, and it's a war that you lost, if we'll say it like that, because you 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 were driven out of something that you know now you never should have been in the first place. But that's okay. Take it as a learning experience. You you'll be able to help somebody else. But I strongly suggest this: if you are really hurting or are really angry, you, you know, you're still feeling like this on the inside when when you think about that experience. Don't go anywhere else. Don't go anywhere else for now. Ask the Lord. So as when, when I left that, left that second church, this is what I said. I said, I'm not going anywhere else. <laughs> I said, I'm not going anywhere else. I said, Lord, I'm starting over. I'm going to assume I know nothing other than the fact that I'm saved. I'm starting over. I got out of whack some kind of way. Tell me where I went wrong. Tell me what I had right. I'm starting from here. And he did. Showed me where I was wrong in some areas. I'm, I still learn, even now, learning things, you know. I mean, we're going to learn it. We're going to learn about the Lord until our last day. So, you know, get used to that. But um, we... Uh, the Lord started showing me, okay, you were good here, here, missed it here, scripture here, you know, and, and you know, it took some time. It took some time. And uh, after about a year or so is when I heard about uh, the church that I'm attending now and uh, began to hear they were doing a lot of teaching about how to hear from the Lord for yourself. And it was such, I, I really need to be there, you know, because... I didn't realize, as I mentioned earlier, that the, I was learning about the Holy Spirit as my teacher, but they talked specifically about that. And as I mentioned earlier about the book, um, The Walk of the Spirit, Walk of Power, you'll see a whole, a whole lot more about that. Another thing I wanted to mention is if, you've, if you have left or are planning on leaving your fellowship, if, if you're in, in a mess like that and you leave, be prepared for false accusation. First thing they're going to say is that you're in rebe either you're in rebellion against God uh, you you are in, you are being influenced by the spirit of religion. You don't want God. Oh, every every derivative of something like that you will be accused of. You may even have broken fellowship from the people that you had known for years. You know, and they don't want to have anything to do with you because they told you that oh they left because they weren't quote of us. They use the, the verse you know about the the false t teachers that leave you know said that they, you know they really more they'll use that again you know as an accusation against you. It'll be hard to rejoice during those times. It really will. It'll be it'll be quite painful for you. But you need to think about that you're free. You need to focus on the scriptures that you're free from that stuff. And as you continue to rebuild your walk with God in the sense of getting it on a, fir a firmer foundation and where the error is leaving, and, and, and import, very important that the angst inside of you about you or maybe the, peop the, the leaders that deceived you, when that goes away, you know, you may be at a point if the Lord leads you to go to another fellowship. A lot of times we hear so often Hebrews um, 6 uh, verse 25 where it says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as some have, but exhorting one another. I'll, I'll go ahead and read that one. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. That has been used to scare, used as a verse for church membership when the book of Hebrews was written to 
Jews who had become Christians and they were facing persecution. I mean, horrendous persecution, and the only way that they would be free of it was they went back to the synagogue. So forsaking the assembling in that context was leaving Jesus in the salvation, the covenant that currently exists, and going back to a dead covenant that no longer exists, and going back to the synagogue. That's the context of that scripture. It has nothing to do with church membership, but that's a lot of times that's what it's used for. And then, as I mentioned, trusting the Holy Spirit as your teacher, that he will lead you into the truth that you need to know and exactly what you need to do. You can trust him. He has already set us free from sin and from hell. And as we gain knowledge about what we've been set free from and what we have in him, um, it will be a lot harder for us to be sucked into bondage and into the spirit of religion because we will have the, we'll have the uh, understanding of God's word, of who we are, what we have, and what we can experience in the Lord. I know this is normally longer than we normally do. Uh, we usually try to keep these at an hour, but I really wanted to finish this, uh, this uh, broadcast um, in its entirety because I felt like I needed to really set a biblical foundation of, of who you are and what you can experience in believing in Jesus and compare it to some of the things that you may hear from teachers that um, some may be sincere, some may be hucksters, or in some circles they call them pulpit pimps, pimping the people, fleecing the flock, you know, just to keep you there so you, so you can, you can um, give them money so that they can live rich, you know, live large or whatever. But um, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, the broadcast today, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you could very well have questions, you know, maybe maybe you'd like a little bit more elaboration on some of the things that I've mentioned today. Um, if you do, feel free to uh, ask your questions on the contact page of IctusNet Live. The link, again, is uh, www.ictusnetlive.com, and uh, click the um, um, when you go into the main website, you can click the contact um, link or button at the bottom of the screen and um, send us an email with details, and we'll be glad to uh, communicate with you. Um, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast that um, normally uh, we do this as a bilingual broadcast, but my husband will do uh, a French version of this. We f he felt like that I should do it completely in English so people could focus on a lot of the information, but my husband will be doing, Bernard will be doing a French version of, the, of uh, this teaching at a later date. Um, our website is in English and in French, and so we can receive, communi we can see receive communication in English and respond in, in, in English and in French and respond accordingly. Uh, we also have uh, um, a mailing list um, where if you create a free IctusNet user account um, on there, one of the things that we ask is uh, what is your preferred language. You can select French, or if you select French with English translation, we'll know that you're bilingual, that you can, rec you can receive, you can understand our newsletters in English and our newsletters in French. And so please tell your French speaking uh, friends about IctusNet Live that is in French now and that. Um, we do a lot of uh, bilingual French programming that they can enjoy. And uh, I just want to tell you that my husband and I, we care so much for you. That's why we do this broadcast. Uh, when we first uh, started IctusNet Live, we had no plans to teach or do anything like that. But the Lord instructed us to start this uh, video blog called It's Not Complicated. I think it's called Semi Compliqué in French. And um, so we, we've been doing it for a few months now. And uh, before we end this broadcast, I just want to pray for you all because this is a, a message near and dear to me, mainly because of, of getting to meet some of you, some of you that have communicated with us and also from what I've walked free from. And I just want to see people really enjoying their, their relationship with Jesus. And the only way that we are going to enjoy our relationship with Jesus is to know the truth about who Jesus is and what, what he has for us. So I want to pray with you right now. Lord, I just thank you so much for those that are watching right now and that will watch later on YouTube. Lord, I just thank you so much that you came to set us free. You didn't come to put us in bondage. I thank you, Lord, that those that are listening, if they, that whatever stage they may be in when it comes to um, 
you know, being in a ministry, if they're if they're currently in a bad ministry, Lord, I just pray that they will they will have the courage to leave, knowing that they're not learning truth, they're learning they're learning error that will damn them later on down the line. And Lord, I just I, if if a person has just come out of a bad bad ministry, Lord, my prayer is that they will trust the Holy Spirit within them, that they'll trust God's word, and that they will take the time to heal and that the, that have, let the Holy Spirit minister to them your love and your passion for them. And Lord, for all, all of us, continue to build that confidence that we can know the truth through your word, that we can know the truth um, through the Holy Spirit. I, I gave so many verses that we can know the truth and we're expected to know the truth. We're expected to know the word and to understand right and wrong teaching where we hear it. And Lord, I just thank you so much that, that we can rejoice today, no matter where we are, we can rejoice today knowing that we can walk free from deception, that we can know your truth and that's what you want us to know and that we can enjoy you and that, that through you we can enjoy our Father, that you reconciled us to him. And Lord, I just pray a blessing on these people today that they, that they will leave and that they'll go about their lives rejoicing that they know a little bit more about you today. And Lord, I just thank you for that. And I just I pronounce a blessing on them. Amen. And I thank you right now. And uh, we will end this broadcast. And I believe it will be my husband. Um, we'll be doing the next broadcast in two weeks. So until, until then, may the Lord bless you all. And um, we'll catch you next time. God bless. Bye-bye.